Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Robert Sykes is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance in episode 107 and episode 277 of Boundless Body Radio. I was also fortunate enough to be hosted on his fantastic podcast, the Keto Savage Podcast, back on June 7th, 2021, titled Pivoting, Mindset, and Living a Life Fulfilled. Robert Sykes is a natural ketogenic bodybuilder, podcast host, author, and entrepreneur, as well as the CEO and founder of Keto Savage, a health and fitness company that offers coaching, training, and nutrition for athletes and bodybuilders. He is also the CEO and founder of Keto Brick, a company that produces ketogenic meal replacement bars for efficient nutrition with the highest quality ingredients. Sykes holds first-in-class titles from his bodybuilding competitions in several bodybuilding federations and enjoys life with his wife, Crystal, a.k.a. the Lady Savage, who we've hosted on our show on episode 483, and their son, Rigel. He is the author of Ketogenic Bodybuilding, A Natural Athlete's Guide to Competitive Savagery, which is the culmination of all he has learned through his bodybuilding endeavors and client coaching pra- practice. Robert Sykes, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Boundless Body Radio. Hey, man, I'm excited to be here. Always a pleasure chatting with you, brother. It's great to chat with you. I was so grateful for the time that we had in Austin last year where you and I met in person for the very first time um, at KetoCon, which is now going to be um, Hack Your Health moving forward. Um, at the time of the release of this episode, I will have already seen you there back in Austin. Very much looking forward to that. I definitely learned some lessons last time I was in Austin with you guys there, with the keto bar, with the keto snacks that were there, Pedersen Farms cooking up meat the entire time made that entire exhibition hall smell incredible the whole time i wasted a bunch of space bringing like my normal like eggs and bar of of butter and all this stuff i would normally bring as i was packing this year i'm packing up disguises so that i can walk by your booth eat all of your keto bars or (laughs) sorry the keto bricks change my appearance walk back again to eat them again change my appearance again walk by again i'm definitely gonna get my fill this time so (laughs) <laughs> man, no need to change the outfit. I'll happily give it to you, your smiling face anytime you walk by, man. <laughs> Dude, I have never seen so many keto bricks in my life. You guys brought case after case after case. And from the looks of it, you gave all of them away. We we have a, a lot of that we sample for sure. We have them for there for sale too. But yeah, we brought every flavor. Uh, we're bringing even more this year. We got some, we got, oh, a, we got a Keto Con Hack Your Health exclusive flavor that we're bringing this year that uh, will be the first of its kind within the brick lineup. So I'm pretty excited about that. Oh man, I'll be ready with my disguises <laughs> to go. eat them all, man. Um, one of my, one, I had several highlights. Um, one of them was definitely meeting uh, you in person, meeting your wife and, and Rigel in person was super fun. As a one-year-old, he was just crawling around everywhere with tons of energy. So it was awesome to hear him. I gotta say, dude, your presentation on stage I I was a little teary eyed. That was a really, really, really good presentation. I was expecting nothing less from you, but that was a very much a standout moment for me from that conference. Uh, Your talk about um, life and entrepreneurial work that you do and also doing things for the right reasons. I've always gotten that from you. And I very, very much appreciate the way you approach business and and being an entrepreneur in a very, very responsible and meaningful way. Uh, You brought me to tears, man. It was really, really good. Yeah, I uh, did not expect to to tear up when I was presenting, but I certainly did, especially when I was talking about some of those other things, man. Like that was a, I kind of went a different direction with that one. I, I normally talk about, you know, macro manipulations and body recomposition, but with that one, I tried to get more, you know, relatable, more just overall life, lifestyle centric. And uh, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a good for me. I enjoyed that. Pretty, pretty emotional. I'm not crying. You're crying. Um, <laughs> what, what happened with that? Crystal and I kind of talked about this. I recall, but as she was about to give birth, he got into a kind of a sticky situation. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so we we tried to do everything as natural as possible. Like, uh, you know, obviously once you once you go down the rabbit hole of nutrition and you learn about that, then you start learning about you know, just like the chemicals and the phytoestrogens and the xenoestrogens. And you try to improve all your household products, and then you start learning about everything that the Western medicine world teaches you. And it's just like we've tried to go as natural and down to earth as possible. And we tried to do the same thing with our pregnancy. So like all throughout pregnancy, she was eating the real, real foods. Uh, and then with the birth itself, we were planning on doing a home birth uh, without any intervention, without any drugs, anything of that nature. And she had like put in so much work to make that a reality. And pretty much uh, she went 42 weeks. And in Arkansas, uh, which is where we're at, you can't legally do a home birth past 42 weeks so she was pretty much past that point she wasn't really dilated at all there wasn't any movement 
Uh, so we went and got checked out, and the the way Rigel was uh, in the birth canal, he was like face presentation. And with face presentation, there's two different ways. I'm going to butcher this, but there's like two different ways, one of which you can still deliver vaginally. The other one is an emergency C-section. If you don't do the C-section, then to our understanding, uh, you'd run the risk of the mother or the child or both dying. So we obviously went with the emergency C-section on that one. Uh, so definitely far from what we had intended going into the whole process. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. We made the most of it. And we have a beautiful boy to, to, you know, admire now. So we have him. He's healthy, safe, and sound. So is she. And uh, we're just taking one day at a time. That's amazing. That must have been a very intense situation to, to, to feel like not only could something happen to your son, but also your wife, who you love all at once, must have been extremely overwhelming. And uh, yeah, so great that you guys pulled through that. I believe Rigel is two now. Did I see that post on social media? Yeah, he turned two just a couple of days ago. So yeah, uh, and he he's that's awesome. He loves uh, he loves tractors right now. So every other word he said <laughs> tractor, and we got him a tractor for his birthday, and he's been uh, running this thing. He just loves it. Man, I love that. I know that because I subscribe to your amazing newsletter. I subscribe to very 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 few newsletters. I'm trying to unsubscribe to to more than I subscribe to, which I don't even know how that happens. Um, but yours and Doctor Socks and and uh, um, I would say like Nina Teichel's and her sub stack that she does with Gary Taubes are some of the few that I read every single week. I do subscribe to. So thank you so much for that. I recommend all of our listeners go and subscribe to your newsletter. You do a great job. Appreciate your reading. Absolutely. Okay. Before we get into what we're going to get into, I, had, I do have a selfish question for you as well. Um, you've had a recent experience with this. I suck at this. I just had a recent experience with this yesterday. How do you respectfully disagree with somebody on your podcast? <laughs> I heard the episode that you did with, um, I think she was a gut expert and she was talking about the necessity of fiber and saying how, you know, you need fiber in your diet and all this stuff. And, you know, all of us listening are like, you know, starting to kind of get the twitches like, uh, I don't know about this. Um, how are you able to like respectfully kind of disagree with people when they have a different, uh, you know, opinion than you of something in, in the health space that you feel fairly confident about? Yeah, I mean, honestly, man, like I just throw like I'm not a doctor. I don't have any MDs, PhDs behind my name, so I just kind of turn to anecdotal evidence, which some people have, you know, varying opinions on. But like I can point to it with utmost certainty and confidence because it's it's me, it's my reality, and also with my clients I've worked with. And you know, like when it comes to the fiber, like you can't really deny the fact that so many people have totally improved and resolved their health issues by the removal of fiber. So to assume that we have to have it as a required, uh, you know, intake is just far from factual, in my opinion, and just kind of bringing that to light in the conversation is key. But a lot of times, man, just letting people talk, um, they kind of wind up digging their own grave. Like I had one podcast, and I'm always super respectful. Like I'm never uh, a disrespectful host, but I had one podcast with a vegan, and I, I bring people on that I know I'm going to disagree with just so I can get outside opinions. And she was suggesting that people consume uh, a protein intake that is relative to what we consume from colostrum in breast milk. And she was doing the figures, and it wound up being like 4% of her daily calories coming from protein, which for her height equated to about 16 grams of protein a day. And wow. she was suggesting people consume. And I'm like, yeah, I just don't uh, don't agree with that. Uh, but I was respectful. But I don't think anybody listening would have assumed that I would have been in support of that message. <laughs> I hope that's the case. Um, we had somebody reach out recently who's the author of the book Carbivore. And they reached out to host the author, and I'm like, oh, understandable it's one letter you got it wrong we do carnivore you do carbivore like sorry like we're not really that compatible and they reply back and said like we think it's going to be a good discussion we'd still like to come on and have the, the the author on and and we did a discovery call that she wanted to do and i could tell that no, no nothing personal to her but she was not equipped to deal with some of the questions that i had about the book we definitely agreed with a lot of the things that she said definitely in favor of you know, reducing general carbohydrate for most people, getting away from sugar, using CGMs and all kinds of stuff that we definitely agreed about. But I had a whole list of questions of stuff that I didn't agree with and wanted to address in the episode. But I could tell she hadn't like done as much of the research into like red meat causes cancer was one of her claims. The blue zones were up there. Um, Long term ketosis is, you know, harmful. I just ended up avoiding all of it and doing my own kind of solo episode where I address some of that stuff myself. But it's as listening, you know, listening to your show and you have people come on that you don't always agree with. You always do such a great job at that. So I, I yeah, appreciate that response. A lot of agencies pitching you podcast guests. 10 a day, like 10 a day, like tons. Yeah, I get a lot too. And sometimes, 
I mean, I accept a lot of them. I accept more often than not. Um, and some of them are really good. Like some people I never would have met otherwise if they're not really in the keto space, the carnivore space. Like I never would have encountered them had it not been for this agency reaching out to me. But some of them are incredibly far fetched. And I just like, you know, don't don't take up on those. Uh, but it is interesting how that whole process works. It it is, yeah, definitely. The best one I ever got was, hey, uh, would you like to host this author? She's coming out with a new book called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. It's Dr. Georgia Ede. You know, she's putting out this book. Do you think you want to interview her? Like, uh, are yes, like now? Let's absolutely. I've been trying to reach out to her for years. Most of them that we get, are, I'm assuming, are probably the same that you get, where you can tell this person has just created a program. They're trying to sell a book or a concept or whatever. And it, that is where, to me, I don't get the as much like authentic content. You know what I mean? And I, I tend to kind of avoid those um, and usually can't believe them fast enough. I thought the concept of carbivore was interesting. And frankly, I was surprised they wanted to do it. So anyway, I just wanted your feedback on that. Yeah, I got a Kate Shanahan coming on my podcast here soon. She's the one that wrote Deep Nutrition, which is one of the books that we read throughout the pregnancy. Um, yeah. One of my favorite books. Like, it's a great book. And I, I got in contact with her through one of those agencies. So, yeah, I always oh, read it. Awesome. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Yeah, exactly. Man, well, it's been a long time since we've had you on. Like we said in the introduction, we've had Crystal on last year, but it's actually been two years since you and I chatted. Uh, can you get people up to speed on you know who you are? We talked about you obviously a little bit in the introduction, how you found keto and how that's going for you today on the note of like long-term ketosis being harmful. How are you finding it these days? Yeah, I think I'm pretty much about to wither away uh, into ashes. You look like it. Yeah, I feel like it. Um no, I mean, shoot, it's been a long time if we hadn't talked since 2021. But yeah, I did a, I did five competitions in 2023. Um, and I, I don't typically compete. I don't ever compete every year. As a natural athlete, it's not really conducive to compete every year. So I typically take, you know, three, four years off in between competitive seasons. I prepped for 2020, but then right before the, the shows, they all got canceled from COVID. Uh, so I did several shows in 2023 to kind of redeem myself, so to speak, and went pro within the WNBF Federation in October. Um, and then I did two pro shows, uh, including Worlds, which is the most prestigious natural bodybuilding competition in the world. Literally, there was like, I think, 66 different countries represented there. It was a massive show. Uh, and I was up there with the best of the best. Um, and I was all with the ketogenic approach. So I haven't had carbohydrates as a staple. Like, I haven't had a carbohydrate-based meal in eight, nine years now. So as far as long-term ketosis is concerned, I'm definitely in the camp of uh, the more, the longer, the merrier. <laughs> If you're listening and not watching, you are missing out on a very, very healthy human being looking back at me. They don't look like they're suffering in the least. Bodybuilding is definitely not my thing. I do have a tendency to say we're all bodybuilders. You and I have talked about that in the past. We all need to be thinking about that. And when you're talking about you know, core principles of health and aesthetic, which I absolutely think aesthetic is part of overall health. The people that have been getting things right for a long time have been bodybuilders. So you just have to acknowledge that. They know a lot about the human body. They help us out a lot. The little I know about it um, is that you you prepare for such a long time and you need to peak for this certain event. And it's like you peak and that peak is very, very small. Like in, in cycling, I would do the same thing. Like I would go into a season under trained knowing that the people who had been training really hard in the off season would be winning a lot of races early on, but they would fade as they were past their peak and I would win a lot of races. That's kind of how I won as much as I did with bodybuilding. It's kind of a similar thing. You can't be on your peak the whole time. And so to see that you did five competitions, how were you able to kind of manage and maintain that and stay quasi peaked the whole time? That's crazy to me. Yeah, it was, it was rough, man. I mean, my goal was to become the leanest man on planet Earth for that finite period of time. So in doing so, I think I accomplished that, but I probably sacrificed an ideal peak when I got super ultra lean because when you're 3.9% body fat, like you do sacrifice some muscle glycogen, you're not as filled out, you don't have that fullness look that you would want on stage. I probably sacrificed a little bit of my stage appeal when i got that lean but the the bodybuilding competitions were kind of secondary to my goal of becoming the leanest man on planet earth um so i was fine with it all i probably peaked peaked for that october show that i went pro at and then as i got leaner from there i probably started to sacrifice that look and that fullness um but yeah man it was, it was brutal like my first show was in september my last show was mid-november i dieted down for 33 weeks 33 weeks in total um and i went from 182 pounds at 16, 17% body fat down to, I think my lightest was 151.3 and 3.9% wow. body fat. So yeah, oh my I, was, goodness. 
and right now I'm I'm fully you know in the building phase now, so I'm back up to you know 16% body fat. I'm 190 pounds now, so put on some weight, uh, put on some muscle. Uh, and I'm in a healthy state now, but yeah, I was I was dialed in there for a while. Yeah, that's really really lean. Can you explain to the listener why getting that lean it it is awesome and helps you with bodybuilding competitions, but but health wise long term shooting for targets like that is not necessarily the greatest thing for health. Oh, hundred percent. Not the greatest thing for health. Like I will not <laughs> sidestep that claim at all because I mean, when you're that lean, like when you're sub 5% body fat as a male, I mean, things just start shutting down. Like your horm your hormones are jacked up, uh, your leptin and ghrelin hormones, but also your sex hormones. Like my total testosterone was 86. Um, oh my goodness. 9% body fat. Like that is not healthy because like, everything is so tightly linked to what your, what your body fat percentage is, what your caloric intake is. And I mean, I was depleted from a body fat standpoint, but also from a nutritional standpoint at that point. Um, so yeah, everything just starts shutting down. So you certainly don't want to maintain that level of conditioning for any length of time. Your performance starts to suffer, your strength starts to decline. Like you don't want to maintain that any longer than you have to. But for that finite period of time, the psychological gain that I get from it is worth the the risk. Like I come out of each comp competitive prep, you know, competitive season so much stronger as a human being, so much more mentally resilient, so much more grateful and thankful. Like I learn so much each time I compete. And every time I've done a competitive season, like I've, I've, you know, moved forward, uh, you know, tremendously as a person, like this was a, a spiritual awakening for me with this last prep. Um, and every prep kind of brings something new to light for me. So there's a lot more net positive than negative, but yeah, you definitely don't want to adhere to that level of conditioning and depletion for long. Yeah, well, I appreciated that you wrote all of this in your weekly newsletters, and you were very open and forthright with that. I'm probably one of the, the perverts that was reading your thing and going, like, scanning down directly to libido, seeing what was happening, like, week to week. I know a lot about Robert. We're getting real personal as far as, like, his libido going down. That, that's a real challenge, man. Like you mentioned, like, all your hormones are just in a different kind of place. And I, I would expect you to say that the biggest benefit is – mentally emotionally spiritually being able to commit yourself to doing something and and going through that process must make so many other things in your life seem so much easier after doing something so challenging yeah for sure man i mean i, I definitely consider bodybuilding to be more so a mental and emotional sport than a physical sport obviously there's a massive physical component to it but yeah i mean what you learn about yourself internally spiritually emotionally uh mentally is is hard to hard to to quantify because we don't really live in an era anymore where you have to wake up wondering if you're going to survive or not. Like we have to kind of bring in that self imposed hardship. And bodybuilding for me is a great vehicle to do so. But then as you grow through it, you're able to kind of transcend the sport itself, and all those life lessons and character traits bleed into every other component of your life. Like I've become a better better father, a better husband, a better entrepreneur, all because of what I've learned in, in bodybuilding. Yeah. Okay. I really appreciate that. I think you're the best in the world at this. So I don't want to let this slip. We've talked about this in the past, but I've, I've had some experience with this as well, using metabolic carts on people and measuring people who have done diets of, of various kinds and how it affects their metabolic rate, not only shifts how many calories they burn, but also where they're burning their calories from. You can really lower your metabolic rate and burn lots of carbohydrates and not burn much fat by eating a low fat, high carbohydrate diet that's deficient in calories. I saw it all the time. And to get somebody out of that requires a specific protocol to make somebody not gain a bunch of weight. And we call this reverse dieting. So again, your world in kind of the bodybuilding space is one thing, but I think this applies to pretty much everybody out there who has done a diet for any amount of time and has noticed that impact of like, you're just kind of feeling a little sluggish, your cravings are a little higher. You're maybe feeling a little cold or low energy. Tell us a little bit about how you manage reverse dieting and how you people how you help people understand that concept. Yeah, so reverse dieting is is super important, man, and it's kind of it's kind of starting to become a controversial topic, which is interesting. It's interesting that it's controversial, uh, but like at a very high level, I think we could all agree that you know metabolism isn't a very adapt. It is a very adaptable thing. So like if you're chronically restricting your intake, whether you're in a prep or you're just simply chronically under eating then your metabolism will be depressed as a result of that because our bodies want to maintain some degree of homeostasis. So if you are consuming less, your body is going to intentionally try and burn less so that it maintains what it thinks to be a homeostatic set point composition. And same is true with like bodybuilding or people that are dieting for you know excessive periods of time, like your metabolism gets depressed, which obviously is, is con not conducive to, you know, upregulating your, uh, you know, metabolic rate. So you have to, correspondingly 
increase your food intake to kind of trigger an uptick in metabolic burn. You can also do that by increasing lean tissue. The more lean muscle tissue you have, the more metabolic demanding that's going to be. But just simply eating more food is going to be probably the single best thing you can do to upregulate your metabolic rate within reason. Like if you just continually eat at a surplus, like you will gain body fat, and that's going to eventually lead to a lack of movement, which will depress your metabolism as well. Um, but all that to say, having a period of time that follows a period of time where you're in a deficit with a period of time in a surplus is incredibly metabolically advantageous. That's basically what the concept of reverse dieting is. So if you are dieting down, decreasing your intake, the reverse of that is to increase your intake. So post-competition for me, that is what I did. I gradually increased my intake until I had reached a healthy body fat and reasonable intake of calories that I could you know, sustain for a long period of time. Um, that's basically what it is in a nutshell. Some people advocate for immediately returning to your new maintenance intake and then progressively increasing from there. Some people recommend a gradual increase from that deficit. Lots of different ways to skin a cat, but the whole overarching theme is to increase your intake beyond that low depressed state that it currently is in. Okay. That was really well explained. What's the controversy? Is it just that there's different methods of doing it? I've not heard that there's a controversy around this. Yeah, different methods. Um, and basically just like what is the most effective method? Not not there's not controversy around whether or not you should have periods of time in a surplus. Like I feel like that's pretty well agreed upon. Um, or at least at a healthy maintenance, but just like the mechanics of reverse dieting, like the best way to go about it, whether you should gradually increase from that low point to minimize, you know, fat gain, or if you should just return to your new maintenance immediately and then increase from there. The problem is when you are that depleted you know, there, there's a massive psychological component to things. So if you just try to start eating a lot of food to return to your new maintenance immediately, you don't really know what your new maintenance is, first of all. And you can't really eat intuitively at that point because your leptin and ghrelin are so out of whack that if you were to intuitively eat, you would intuitively eat 10,000 plus calories, which is obviously a surplus for anybody, uh, you know, most anybody. But, but for me, I like to kind of adhere to the same habits and rituals and pro, you know, programs that I've, that I've used to lead to the success of the prep in and of itself. So I'll gradually start increasing my macros from that low point while maintaining pretty much all my same you know, routines. And then I can accurately pinpoint where my new maintenance is. And I'm not just letting myself kind of go crazy and just consume in excess because I'm kind of keeping the reins more or less tightened up. Okay. I've heard the concept explained in the past where if you've chronically dieted, it might be a good idea to just increase any calorie bomb that you can find, like the milkshakes or, you know, the, the woman that's been on the diet for way too long just needs a burger and fries. Like it's not the time to worry about exact macronutrients or what we would argue is like the most healthy food. Um, I, I, I get that, but I also see that that can cause health issues or gut problems or all kinds of different stuff like that. So to be clear, when you're talking about increasing your macros, increasing your calories, you are doing so in what you would consider kind of a healthy structure that's not much different than the things that you were eating before, just in different quantities. Yeah, it's 100% the same things I'm eating. Like when I'm in a prep or in a, a building phase, like the actual makeup of my food is the exact, the exact same. Like I'm not changing the types of food. I'm just changing the quantities of that food. So I'm always prioritizing the most nutrient-dense, you know, quality foods that I can, playing an emphasis on, you know, where I'm sourcing those foods, making sure that it's all – ideally from local farmers, things that I've, you know, raised or grown or hunted and killed myself or sourced locally that I know what that animal was consuming. Not everybody can do that, but, you know, obviously try and get the best quality you can. But yeah, that's another thing that, like, I'm glad that I'm in the keto space and also the bodybuilding space because there's so much overlap, but there's so much disconnect between the two because, like, the bodybuilders, traditionally, they don't really put much emphasis on nutrient quality where they're sourcing their food like it's more so just what are the macros what are the calories and people in the keto space massive interest in you know the sourcing of the food but not so much of a care in the world towards the calorie count but like if you just simply combine those two worlds you're going to reach the goal much more efficiently yeah well colt milton and i have talked about this i'm sure you've talked to him in the past he's also a bodybuilder on a carnivore diet and it just seems like what i normally see with bodybuilding and diets in particular is like you do the diet temporarily then you jump off and you eat everything and then you get to this like really unhealthy kind of spot where you've gained 40 pounds 50 pounds whatever like like the variance there is so high 
that now you have quite the job to do if you want to do that again and lose all that weight again, where it seems like people in the keto space, they're dealing with such smaller numbers. It's almost like managing type one diabetes with a ketogenic diet where you just have less of the spike in your blood sugar. So you need less of the insulin and it's just so much easier to manage. I think about it the same way with weight and body fat percentage for people that are, you know, trying to care about their aesthetic, which again, I would argue should be everybody like you're, you're not gaining and fluctuating nearly so much. It's a lot more even, you know, it, it, is that something you notice in the space? Yeah. Like for me, I mean, I'm at the peak of my building phase right now from a weight and composition standpoint, I'm at 190, 192 right now. And I would probably compete if I was to diet down right now, I'd probably step on stage at like 155, 159, somewhere in there. So I've got, you know, 30, 35 pounds to lose. That's pretty much the most I would want to have to lose for a competitive season. But yeah, when I was eating carbs, I mean, I ballooned up to 230 at one point and I cut down to 150, wow. I lost 80 pounds in 12 weeks. Wow. Not healthy at all. Not, not recommended at all. Um, but I was eating all kinds of junk food. Now I eat nothing but the highest quality food that I can. And you can most certainly, like I've obviously gained a bunch of body fat since my competitions eating only the best quality food. So you can still get fat if you're eating the right food, the quantity, the, the caloric intake and all of that stuff matters. The hormonal implications of those foods and the quantities matter. It all matters. So kind of taking a holistic approach to what levers you're manipulating, where you're you know, placing an emphasis is very, 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 very important. Yeah, I think that's really reasonable. I love that approach. One of the reasons we brought you on is that I have heard through the grapevine that you have a new program that you've been working on. Um, our mutual friend, Matt Dobbins, um, is somebody that I've really gotten to know quite well. And he is piloting the program. And he, without hesitation, said, you have got to get Robert on to talk about his new program. I know next to nothing about it. So I'm flying blind here. I'm so excited to chat with you about this. I want to know, for somebody who's creating you have so much content. You wrote your book. You put so much stuff out there. What what was the need that you saw to create this program, and what what is it? Tell us about it. Man, I don't know. It's it's um, uh, I feel like sometimes I've, I'm spread so thin that like it's just unmanageable. Like I've got so many different irons in the fire right now. It's driving me crazy. I'm losing sleep, and I feel like things are undone. So like for me being a perfectionist, that that bothers me. But this course is something I'm incredibly proud of. So I've been working on this for the last four years the course itself. And this is basically a summation of all that I've learned over the past 15, 16, 17 plus years. Uh, so it's pretty much everything that I know, having coached over 600 people now, like all that I know as a coach, all that I know as a competitor, all that I know as like a nutritionist and an athlete and a performance centric individual, all of that information is in this course. And, you know, I've been like, I love business. I love entrepreneurship. And uh, as far as like business goes, I've got a couple different legs of the business. So I've got the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do, which is me trading time for money, which I love doing and I will always do, but it's still going to be trading time for money and it's not scalable. I've got the keto bricks, which I love, uh, but there's no margins on the bricks because I put the best quality ingredients in there. So like it makes a lot of revenue, but it makes zero profit because like all of it goes into sourcing the best quality ingredients I can. The course is hopefully an opportunity for me to actually make some money, um, but more, most importantly, to just simply provide a source of value for people that they cannot get anywhere else. Like I have 100% confidence that this course is the best, most comprehensive source of information for anybody wanting to optimize with a ketogenic diet, especially within the realm of bodybuilding. Uh, th like they cannot find anything, any anywhere close resemblance to this anywhere else online like this is going to be like it's 200 plus videos uh, to start with and it's going to be continually growing as i add more content over time there's a community feature there's gonna be challenges with it within the community there's a custom built ai system in there that is pretty freaking slick man like you can ask the ai it's a closed loop ai pretty much from all the stuff that i've said over the years and and put in the book and put in the podcast so you can ask the ai to generate a workout plan based off of certain criteria you can tell it that hey i've got this is my macro goal for the week. Make me a sample meal plan and a grocery list. Exclude my allergens. And then it spits that out for you in an instant. Like it's everything you would ever need to dial in your composition in one unified spot. So I'm super excited about it. You excited about putting me out of business, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying not to do that because I mean I'm I'm gone ultra niche. Uh I mean, I'm doing ketogenic natural bodybuilding, which is about as niche as you can go. Um, and like, I've got a certain style, I've got a certain way of doing things like people that resonate with my style, they'll find value in the course, but like, I don't want it to be competitive to other people that are coaching other people that are doing things because like I'm going ultra niche. I think it'll be a great 
collaborative thing. Like I would love to partner with other people that say and say, Hey, look, if you've got clients that want to take it to the competitive, you know, side of things, you know, let's partner up and we can give them access to the course. Uh, and we can just, you know, build, build a better foundation to begin with. Mm, well, <laughs> have you seen the tonal exercise equipment? Like it's a, it's basically you install it on the wall and it's got arms that you can adjust and you can do like cable, um, exercises with it. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen it. I've not used it, but I've seen a few different companies pop up with something like that. Okay. Yeah. So one of my clients got one and he was like, Hey, why don't you come train me on my tonal? And I go over to his house and I have to say like, the thing is nice. It's a lot more mechanical than I thought it would be. And can like give you the exact amount of weight through all the different phases of a lift. And it has tons of programs and it counts for you and all this stuff. I'm like, why did you hire me to train you on my replacement? This thing counts to 12. What do you need me for? <laughs> like, this is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, some stuff coming out, man. It, it's crazy. And I think, you know, like I'm excited about them, but I feel like there's all, and with the AI as an example, like there's so many resources out there that people that, you know, remove human interaction. But I think with that, it makes the demand for human interaction all that more important, uh, which is why I'm excited about the community component of this group. Like that's why I think there's always going to be a place for one-on-one -on -one coaching and just like having people there because people need people. People need accountability. They need uh, camaraderie. They need they need people to be there alongside them. So I think as long as you have that in place, then you're solid. I guess that explains why I haven't been fired. We've done hundreds of workouts on this thing and I uh, haven't been fired just yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, so the videos, again, this is, this is pretty niche. That said, I think a lot of people would be interested in this. People excited about improving their health. They found a ketogenic uh, diet to be very helpful for whatever reason, various reasons, and they care about their aesthetic. So tell us a little bit more about the program. Like, like when you're talking about the videos, are the videos demonstrating exercises? What do the, the, the meal plans or the exercise programs look like? Like, like how, what is, what is a client going to be using that for besides asking the, I like specific questions? Yeah. So I think there's going to be two primary demographics that benefit from it. So one is people that are well-versed in bodybuilding uh, but they're not familiar with the ketogenic approach, and they want to to transition to a ketogenic version of the bodybuilding that they're already familiar with. And the other demographic would be people that are, you know, wanting to get into keto or are, are currently keto. They are fat adapted already, and they want to take it to the next level beyond just what they've been able to do with intuitive eating, uh, you know, eating intuitively and not tracking macros. Like I take all the guesswork out of taking things to the next level. So like there's spreadsheets, there's macro plans, calculations, uh, very unique to the individual how to manipulate foods to meal prep properly and fine tune a body compositional goal. Um, it basically has my seven phase prep protocol laid out uh, with video lessons corresponding to each phase, kind of like the book, you know, you've got my book. So the seven phases that I, you know, have developed through that protocol, uh, that is what I've kind of dubbed the savage system, so to speak. Uh, so that is all laid out with the lessons in the course, but there's like a massive appendix section as well. And the appendix section has, you know, workout tutorials, programming, uh, meal prep, grocery hauls, different recipes, uh, training techniques, posing techniques, posing critiques and criteria for different federations, drug testing, critique and criteria for different federations, uh, and then miscellaneous stuff like how to properly do, you know, hair removal and tanning for a competition, like all the things that you would need to just bring and peak, you know, and bring the best package you possibly could for a competition, a photo shoot, just life in general, like being the best version of yourself and optimizing your performance for a moment in time. Okay. Awesome. Um, when we hosted Matt Dobbins, we talked about this a little bit, the need for tracking itself. Like you kind of mentioned eating intuitively is one thing. And generally speaking in the ketogenic realm, I kind of lean in that direction. Like just focus on fats and proteins, try to get your carbohydrates down as, as low as you can manage, depending on how strict or liberal you can be, you want to be, how you respond to different foods. Generally speaking, if somebody's eating to satiety, focusing on those things, I think it's fine. I do see a lot of value in people tracking. And again, what you mentioned was some people need to track, other people don't. What benefits do you see when people are doing the tracking and when do you really recommend that for somebody? Yeah. So when it comes to that, like, um, you know, like if you're coming from a standard American diet and you just simply want to, you know, major in, the, the most bang for your buck. So like a classic 80-20 analysis of things. Like if you eat real quality foods, focus on fats and proteins, remove dietary carbohydrates, boom. Like that's going to set you up for the vast majority of the success in the world. Like we can pretty much fire all the keto coaches right now and say, hey, do that, and you're good. Uh, but for the people that want to take it to the next level, 
and you know really get things dialed in, reach a new level of body fat, uh, performance, um, you know, conditioning, strength building, things of that nature. Controlling for the variables and getting things dialed in is going to require more effort than just simply intuition. Um, so, you know, manipulating macros, meal prepping, being consistent with your consumption, being consistent with your training, uh, having a well-structured training program, like all that's going to be key. Like when I'm eating intuitively, I can be very healthy and I can lean out, I can build muscle, I can do all these things. But in order for me to get down to 3.9% body fat and be the best in the world, I'm tracking every single thing to the gram because it requires that degree of adherence and just, you know, accuracy. Uh, so I teach people how to do that. Okay. That's great. That's very well explained. I think that will help people know which direction to go. Um, what are the common mistakes that people make um, outside of tracking? Like when they're pursuing ketogenic bodybuilding, they're trying to build more muscle. A lot of people say that you need carbohydrates to build muscle. We can comment on that. What are some of the other common mistakes you often hear in this space? Honestly, man, just people not being consistent for a long enough period of time. Like if you start diving into the interwebs, there's so much controversy on there. There's not enough of a structured program to follow that people actually adhere to. Uh, like depending on which blog you're going to, which YouTube video you're watching, you'll find out that, you know, too much protein's good, too much protein's bad, too much fat's good, too much fat's bad. You can only eat sardines for a week. Like there's all these weird things out there on the internet and people don't have the proper structure. And there's like a lag effect with manipulation. So I may make a manipulation to my nutrition today and it may not respond. Like I may not respond to that for two weeks down the road. And without a structured plan, People just assume that nothing's happening, nothing's changing, so they throw up their hands in despair and then deviate and do something else. Uh, this provides the roadmap that just takes the guesswork out of it. Like if you are manipulating these things in the, the correct way, in the sustainable way, then you will see the progress you know, build over time. You'll, you'll generate that momentum. Like when I'm making manip uh, manip manipulations for macros, like I'm changing macros in five or 10 gram increments, you know, very, very, very gradual changes. And that elicits the response that I'm looking for over a sustainable period of time, which is what I've structured a prep or fat loss phase to be. Like a lot of people are trying these eight-week cuts. And if you're dieting aggressively for eight weeks, yeah, you can lose some body fat, but you're going to plateau. You're going to risk losing lean tissue. Like there's a lot of bad that comes with that. Whereas if you have a very structured program that takes, you know, four to six months that preserves as much lean tissue as you can possibly do, that improves your overall metabolic and hormonal function and just ensures that you don't plateau, you know, yeah, it's going to be over a longer period of time. It's going to be done the right way, and you can rest assured that it's going to work if you adhere to the plan. Okay. Is it safe to assume that of the macronutrients that you're manipulating, the protein component is probably the most important, but also the most stable through different phases of training? It's interesting, man. It's honestly one of the big uh, deviations from me that a lot of other coaches do. Like, I don't keep protein constant. A lot of people keep protein constant, generally constantly high. Uh, and I'll have periods of time when my protein is very low and then I'll have periods of time when my protein is very high and then it goes back low again. Like there's, depending on the context of where you're at in the prep, whether you have, uh, you know, a lot of calories or a few calories, whether you are higher body fat or lower body fat, those are all different instances in which you would want to manipulate the variables that you have at your discretion. And if you're doing a ketogenic approach, then the carbohydrates are going to be pretty low. So you pretty much just have the fats and proteins to manipulate. And in that context, there are times where it's beneficial to have a higher fat ratio, uh, i.e. lower protein or higher fat or combination of the two. And there are times when it's beneficial to have a lower protein. So like when you were in a deficit, the single best thing you can do to preserve lean tissue is to continue to train hard. And yes, you need to have protein to preserve that tissue. But if you are fat adapted and you're getting your energy from fat and you're consuming hardly any fat, then your hormones are going to suffer, your energy is going to suffer, and you're not going to be able to recover to train hard in which case you're going to lose more muscle. So kind of counterproductive or counterintuitive rather, but there are times where I've noticed increased muscle preservation in the context of lower protein and higher fat because of that increased recovery and overall training energy that the higher fat elicits because the protein is not going to be what's giving you energy to train. I mean, it can through gluconeogenesis, but that's not a very efficient process and not a very great substrate for fuel. So if you are you know, leaving your energy on the table by having, you know, def deficient fat sources, like you would be better off reducing your protein some and adding in more fat. Interesting. That's a very interesting answer. Um, we hear from some people that you don't need to fear the fat that you're consuming when you're eating fat that's coming from animal products. Primarily, we see people, you know, that, that go to, I won't say an extreme, but you, you see people like eating, you know, cubes of butter and they say the fat that you consume 
cannot make you fat. It, it goes into the body through the lymphatic system, gets distributed for energy, and it gets burned off for energy. How would you respond to that? Uh, if you are eating too much dietary fat, even if it's quality animal fat, then you will put on fat. I mean, like, that's just, I mean, there is definitely a thermodynamic still apply when you're on a ketogenic fat adapted carnivore diet. Like, I'll just use myself as an example. You know, I only ate fats and proteins post competition, and I went from 3.9 percent body fat to currently 15 or 16 percent body fat, only eating fats and proteins. So, to assume that you cannot get fat. By only eating fats and proteins uh, is, is just not true, you know? Okay. Yeah. Really good point. And I know you do such a great job of sourcing your foods. If somebody were eating along the lines of a more conventional food, maybe grass-fed, grass-finished was not available to them, price prohibitive or their location, you know, living in a city or something like that was more difficult for them. What kind of protein sources would you have somebody generally focus on? Uh, do you find things like pork or eggs or any of those things to be difficult for some people? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is, you know, if you're getting meat from conventional systems, then you're going to be better off getting leaner cuts and then adding quality fats simply because any impurities are going to be stored in the fats. Uh, so if you're getting like a super fatty cut from like a Walmart, you know, you're going to have more impurities in the fat of that beef than you would say, uh, you know, the same ratio of fats, proteins in a grass finished version from your local farmer. Um, now that said... I don't want anybody to assume that you have to have the best of the best to adhere to this plan. Like you can make it work with what with whatever you have. But if price is a concern, then try and opt for leaner cuts and then add quality fats in. That's probably going to be more cost effective. And then also try and source, you know, meats from a ruminant animal as opposed to a monogastric animal like a chicken or pork. Because with a ruminant like a cow, a sheep, lamb. Uh, you know, deer, they're going to upcycle, upregulate the nutrition that they eat because of their, you know, ruminant system. They've got a four chamber stomach. They can eat lower quality stuff and it upregulates. Whereas like with a monogastric animal, like a chicken or a pork, it's much more so a matter of they are what they eat. So if they're eating crap food, that's going to be a lot, lot more represented in the meat that you are then consuming from them. Okay. I love that explanation. Um, I wanted to ask you also something um, that you were bringing up with uh, Dave Feldman, a recent guest you had on the show about um, lean mass hyper responders and people in the bodybuilding space who are trying to gain muscle are, you know, adding lots of muscle. They're very active. I, I'm curious to know what your carbohydrate intake level would be, but you asked Dave specifically, like, it's interesting. I'm really lean yet. I'm not a lean mass hyper responder, he had a great explanation, which I don't <laughs> expect you to remember everything uh, about that. But like, I guess in the, in, in the sense of, first of all, cholesterol, like do you, are you worried about somebody's cholesterol increasing when they're eating a low carbohydrate diet, especially if they're more into like cardio kind of sports versus strength training. And second of all, when you're giving people carbohydrate recommendations for ketogenic bodybuilders, what, what type of level are we talking about? Yeah, so yeah, Dave Feldman's brilliant. Uh, he can throw out a lot more fancy, bigger words than I can on the, off the cuff for sure. As far as cholesterol goes, like I don't technically meet the criteria for his lean mass hyper responder definition. I believe he explained it because I have so much lean tissue as a proportion and percentage of total body weight that that lean tissue kind of acts as a kind of like um, you know the more muscle tissue you have, the more insulin sensitive you are. Generally speaking, because it kind of acts as a uh, sink to you know glucose metabolism. He was kind of saying, and don't let me butch this, but it was something similar to like the same effect happens with cholesterol, LDL cholesterol specifically, if you have a lot of lean tissue and you're fat adapted because you're using that as an energy source and that's basically getting shuttled uh, in the high demand of your energy output. And if you have more muscle, it kind of acts as a sink to that as well, which is why my LDL is probably not you know through the roof. It is elevated. Like if like by Western medicine standards, I do have elevated LDL. Um, but my HDL is also incredibly high and my trigs are super low. Like I think my trigs are 46 last time I tested. Uh, so for me, if my LDL is within reason and my HDL is high and my trigs are low, I'm not really concerned. Like if I woke up one day, got a blood test and my trigs were through the roof, then I might readdress some things. But every time I've tested, my trigs have been very low. My HDL has been very high and my LDL has been moderate. So when you take that into uh, you know consideration, the actual – cholesterol ratio that I've always had has been totally within the standards, within the green lines of what is good and to be expected. It's just that my LDL is elevated, but because my HDL is also elevated and my trigs are low, I'm in the clear. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that'd be what I say there. As far as carbs go, 
Man, when I'm in a prep, I'm pretty much capped into like 20 grams of total carbs. Uh, if you throw in all the electrolytes I consume, like like I'll do, you know, I'll do a lot of electrolytes. Like I was taking in between 10 and 15,000 milligrams of sodium uh, throughout a lot of that prep. And some of that was coming from like those LMNT packets, you know. Each one of those is like two grams of carbs depending on the flavor. So if you count that, it probably gets up to like 30 grams of total carbs, 35 maybe. Um, but pretty low. And by the very end of my prep, when my calories are lower and I'm getting less trace carbs in, I mean, my total carb probably around, you know, 10, 15 grams tops. Uh, wow. So yeah, pretty minimal on the carbohydrate consumption. Wow. I sometimes have a bad habit of asking my guests two questions at once. And those were two of the more technical questions I could have asked you one at a time to make it a little bit more manageable. And, and to your credit, you handled that amazingly. So thank you very much for that um, that episode. I really love that episode that you did with Dave Feldman. I listened to it twice in preparation for interviewing him as well. Um, another one of my favorite episodes that I want to kind of conclude with I, I, that I really loved is an episode you did with your wife. I love the episodes that you guys do together. It was the conclusion of last year where you were talking about life balance and a little bit of how life balance is it's, it's a nice kind of thought. It's nice to talk about. It's a nice thought, but who really has life balance? And you, you used the term tensegrity and, and you talked about a few different pillars. I thought this was really important. And you're like my favorite person to talk about not just health and fitness and macros, but also deeper life things. I, I love how you get into this. And so can you talk about that concept of tensegrity and the pillars and how uh, you have some examples of how that shifted in your own life? Yeah, yeah. I actually had a podcast yesterday and we were talking about this as well. So I'm glad it's come up again here. Uh, but yeah, the whole balance, work-life balance concept, I've always kind of subscribed to the mentality that balance is bullshit because by definition, if something is balanced, perfectly balanced, then both ends of the fulcrum or the balance beam are at zero. And I don't want anything in my life to be zero. Uh, and then if something else is increasing, then by definition, something else is decreasing. And I don't want that either. Uh, so tensegrity is an architectural term, uh, basically blending tensional integrity. And basically it states that uh, as tension is applied to these different components of the structure, the overall integrity and strength of that structure is enhanced. And when I look at my life, and most people can break their life down in some form or fashion similarly to this, but when I look at my life, the primary five pillars that I place significance on are you know, relationships, health, wealth, spirituality, and self-development. Like if I'm moving the needle forward in those five pillars, then my life is progressing and I'm finding fulfillment. And, you know, there's a, you can have a hierarchy on those. You can have periods of time where, you know, you are emphasizing one over the other, but at the end of the day, they should all be symbiotic in nature and working on one should in inherently benefit all the other four. Uh, it's not distracting from them so much as it is improving them all. Like all uh, rising tide raises all ships, so to speak. So everything in my life can fit into those five pillars and kind of be cohesive in nature. So uh, yeah, throughout last year when it was the prep, you know, obviously the nutritional pillar, the the health pillar was getting a lot of the emphasis. Um, right now, I'm really focusing on uh, the business side with this course. So that wealth pillar will hopefully be getting a lot of emphasis. But like every every one of those pillars is getting targeted in some form or fashion every single day so that I can keep the progress moving forward across all important avenues of my life every single day. Is it just common sense and intuition where you know that one is dropping off or do you get certain signs um, and I guess like symptoms that you need to put more focus into something? Yeah, like um, for for me, the relationship category oftentimes gets the the back burner and that's not good, obviously. Uh, my wife reminds me when that's when that's the case. Uh, but having a son, you know, like it, it's made it that much more obvious that hey, this is not getting attention it deserves. I need to put more time in it. And having a son that's you know growing so quickly, it's like I'm going to lose these moments if I don't prioritize them. So now I, I make it a point to be present with him uh, and just soak in those moments and and really just engage with him fully. Uh, so that's kind of helped bring that component into more. Uh, you know, attention and light as of late. Uh, but yeah, I feel like there's like a pulse on everything. I've got a pulse on all those five pillars and I feel like something is uh, not getting the time and attention it deserves. And I just simply reallocate my resources and time until that it is getting met. Okay. Well, along those lines and along with what you said earlier, where you have so many irons in the fire, you're very busy, you're very driven. How are you able to also just kind of detach, take time for yourself, 
be spiritual? How, how are you able to do that? Because it's so tempting to be doing way too much all the time and trying to hit home runs in all of those categories, like you mentioned. Yeah. So for me, uh, my morning hours are sacred, man. Like I wake up early and before I look at my phone, before I do anything, I, I get some, get some water in me make a cup of coffee, feed the dog. And then I like pray, meditate and journal. And then I do that pretty much without fail every single morning, first and foremost. Like if I don't do that, then, then I'm, I'm screwed up for the day. Uh, so I do that. And that's been kind of like my oasis before anybody else wakes up before Rigel's awake, before the business demands of the day start hit me. Uh, I just have that time carved out to be spiritual, to pray, to meditate, to journal, to reflect. And then once that moment has happened, then I can tackle the rest of the day with confidence. Yeah, I love that. I think we know our most successful people, they are taking time in the morning hours to be able to do that. And the people that seem to have a better morning routine seem to set themselves up, some, themselves up for success during the day. So I really appreciate that. This conversation has been awesome. As I expected, it was covering a lot of different topics and got a lot of really, really good information about a lot of different things. So much looking forward to seeing you in person here um, in a week and a half at the time of this recording. Can't wait to see you and uh, hopefully Crystal and Rigel as well. For now, where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? And where can they find the course as well? Yeah, so the course is just about to go live, man. So by the time this podcast is released, it probably will be. It'll be at ketobodybuilding.com. Uh, so if you, you search ketobodybuilding.com, you'll find me, the course. Uh, Keto Savage is what I'm at on social, Keto Brick for the Bricks. Uh, but yeah, you type any of those and you'll find me. That's awesome. We will link to all of that in the show notes. I'm so excited for you. Um, I know how much work you put into this. I actually don't know how much work you put into this. It sounds like it's been a long time coming, but hearing from Matt, who's had a, a pilot, a version of this, he was so adamant that we talked to you about it. And so it's going to provide a very high value for people out there. And I just, again, when I look at people who are in our space and are doing really good work, but not only doing really good work. They're doing really good work for really good reasons. You're just such an example to look up to. So I just really appreciate you and how you approach things and how you you get your word and your message out to people out there. It's just with, with so much integrity um, and really well done. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy day to be on our show today. Uh, we really appreciate you, man. Hey, man. Always a pleasure. I appreciate you more than you know. I can't wait to see you in person at KetoCon as well. There's everything I can do to help you and your endeavors and pursuits at all, man. You just let me know when I'm there. I really appreciate that. And likewise, anything we can do to help them, well, you, you definitely deserve it and happy to help. So thank yeah. you again for appearing on the show. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Yeah.